All right, let's continue on. As the next video, the next part of this Chip 8 emulator here, C and SDL2. I forget where we last left off. Somewhere up here, maybe after D, after B. So I guess we're on case C, possibly, of the opcodes. I guess we'll go with that. Looks like everything below there we probably have. Yeah, so I'll go with C. The C1000 case. Continue on uh, doing all the opcodes. Hopefully get some input and an actual game plan. This, <laughs> this video here, if it's too slow, then we'll increase the speeds, and that is all right. But let's just go down. There's not too many more. Mostly have to deal with timers and sprites and stuff. So, okay. We'll do C. Looks like RAND. Ooh. Sets so VX to the result of a bitwise AND operation on a random number, typically 0 to 255. Well, we're going to store it within VX, which is 8 bits wide. So, yeah, it would, the result of this would be 255. But they're saying the, the RAND value is probably 0 to 255 in a typical case. And then we're ANDing that, so most likely shrinking it even further with uh, whatever the NN value is. So, okay. So we'll have to set up RAND and then do that. That's not too bad. CXNN. We can do that. This be CXNN and this sets register VX equal to, let's say RAND, RAND zero to 255, I think is just RAND mod 256 to get 0 to 255 inclusive there. We'll do anded with nn bitwise and. Okay. That seems good enough. We can do that. Assuming we have a RAND function, which we'll have to add, but assuming we have a RAND function, we can just put in this code here. So again, we have V offset by X, instruction.x, and that will equal what I just did, rand mod 256 bitwise, anded with NN, which is chip 8, instruction.nn. Get rid of that. Okay. So we don't have rand set up, but that would be the code if we did have rand set up, because rand, I believe, is 3 for the lib. It's in standard lib, which I think we have included. And rand returns 0 to rand max inclusive which is probably at least 16 or 32K, I believe. But anyway, we have standard live, so we can set that up. So, okay, I don't want RAND to be the exact same every time. So when this first starts up every time, I'm going to seed it. I think the typical way that you want to do that is calling srand. We give it a value to seed the RAND number generation with, pseudo random number generation. I don't think it's the best um, pseudo random number generation or PRNG, whatever people call it or abbreviate it to. There's other simple like algorithms and things you can look up for this on Stack Overflow or otherwise. Uh, but I'm just gonna do the, the C way out because it's easy and I looked in SDL doesn't appear to have RNG with it for like some kind of weird cross-platform way to do it, but that's okay, we can use C's built-in stuff. So I'm gonna pass null to time to get the current time, but not put it, just take it for its current value, not put it into uh, a time T struct or anything. So. The current seconds since the Unix epoch of 1970. Uh, we'll pass into SRAND. SRAND is standard live, but time, I believe, we need to include time.h. So I'll do that. So let's seed. We'll seed the random number generator. So then, then when we call RAND, we'll have that work. So, okay, that would be this. That sets VX, and I don't think the test opcodes test for VX being set from a random number, because how are you going to know it's going to be random? But this will come into play for, you know, games like Tetris, or maybe some things for random delays, or enemy AI, or positioning on the screen, or something. I'm sure this would be affecting those within, you know, game logic, for example. They would use this instruction. I'm assuming. You know, I figure Tetris would, because you need the next random piece between, I guess, 0 and 7 for the next... Uh, Tetramino, so yeah. Which, that's a fun word to say. But okay, we'll set V percent X equal to, I'll just say RAND mod 256 anded with NN, which NN will say is 0.02X, which will be within the instruction, but that's just, you know, for debug purposes, we'll repeat that here. 
So v percent x would just be the instruction dot x, and nn would just be instruction dot nn. I think that's decent enough for debug output. Okay. See if we typed it in right, and we didn't. Ran mod two fifty six and nn. Yeah, I guess I should um. I should parenthesize these expressions <laughs> so they make more sense. So let's go back down to C. We want the output value from that and then and that with NN. Right? Yes. So it doesn't like that because unknown type conversion character. Oh, it's taking that as the, the percent for the modulo. Yep. Is this in debug? Yeah, emulation. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, you put two of them, and then that outputs a literal percent sign. Just escape it with itself. That's how you put that within the stream there. There we go. So we're still not gonna run all the test opcode stuff. I don't think it tests for RAND, but I'm just checking because I really honestly don't remember. <laughs> we got everything except the Fs here, F5 and F3. And AX is blank for some reason, even though it's Guaranteed to work, but that's all right. So we do have F6 is also tested and it's unimplemented, but okay. As well as this, as well as this. I guess an easy way of checking that would be running it and outputting to a log and then grepping the log, like I tried to do last time for Bs, which didn't exist. So AX says okay and then disappears. Well, let's do that and grep for unimplemented opcode, I think is what I called it. And it's not, so that's good. <laughs> did I not call it unimplemented? Yeah, it did. What, what did I call it? Unimplemented. Oh, opcode starts with a capital O. Okay. I forget how grep works. Is there insensitive? Case insensitive search? Is that not in here? Is there case? Dash I ignore case? Okay. Makes sense. There we go. So we're not doing, in this one, F1, F0, F6, and F2. So it doesn't check RAND, so that's good to know. So let's see if we can get this for BC test, which is probably going to give us an error because we're not doing the Fs. But I just want to see what it says, and it doesn't exist. That's good. What do I call it? Oh, BC underscore test. Give us an error file. We'll leave it for a minute. And it's checking F3 and F4. So at least F0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and, and 6, if not 5, we should implement. So let's go on to the Fs, I guess, or whatever's next. Whatever's next in the list here, which are E's actually. <laughs> so we can do the key ops, but it checks, you know, some of these. Um, okay. Oh, these are X's. What I should be checking is. These zero A zero A one E seven one five one eight two nine are those being affected? FX two nine FX five five six five three three. So they were checking register dump and load as well as BCD. Okay, and then the memory spread address. Okay, that's okay. We can we can go down the list. I just wanted to make sure I could grab <laughs> unimplemented and, and get that working. So EX9E skips the next instruction if the key stored in VX is pressed. Usually next is a jump. So similar to these conditionals up here, if we equal NN or the other register VY, this checks if the key has been pressed and stored within VX, typically from this FX0A, to get a key and put it into VX. So after you get a key, you can check if a certain key was pressed or not pressed and have conditional logic from that for Moving a player around in a game, we'll say, or something else. Maybe a start or reset button for a game as well, or pause or something. But okay, these are E's, EX9E and EXA1. So we'll go with those. Is this in the background? It is, okay. Let's emulate it first. Go down after here. This is D. Okay, so 0E. I guess we can, there's only two of these, 9E and A1 we could check for. So we can do ifs or switches, it's fine. 
So let's do if chip eight instruction nn equals nine e. And we'll do else if chip eight instruction nn equals a one. Else will break. So 9e is 0x ex 9e. This will skip the next instruction if the key stored in vx is pressed. Okay. Skip next instruction if key in vx is pressed. And a1 is if the key is not pressed. So how would we do these? Well, we know to skip an instruction, we can just increment the program counter. If we have a conditional, that is true. So what would that condition be? So if the key is stored in VX, so we have a keypad in the chip eight object, right? Yeah, we have a keypad of 16 keys, so 0 to F for the 16 key hexadecimal keypad, and a key being pressed, I'm going to set from the handle input function and just set, you know, the 0 to 15 offset within this keypad array. I'll just set it to true if it's pressed, and if the key is not pressed, we'll set it to false. So let's assume we have that logic in place, and if a key is pressed, it will be true. So we can see if the value within uh, vx, which is v offset x, if that equals, no, we want to check if the key in vx is pressed. So if vx were to store a key, and a key can be 0 to f, then vx would equal 0 to f. And since our keypad array only stores the 16 keys, we can offset from the keypad array. That's how we'll do it. So we'll offset into the keypad the value in vx, because if it stores a key, it'll be 0 to f. Of course, this could go out of range if it's beyond that, so hopefully the game logic isn't great. Uh, potential for seg faults there, maybe, but that's, that's just what you're dealing with in C regardless. Since the keypads are guaranteed to be booleans, true or false, we know if it's pressed, it's true, so I can just check if the keypad is, is pressed, it'll be this, or, you know, equals true. Then we'll skip. Simple enough. And we can do the same thing here, except do not, and it will be false, and then we'll skip. <laughs> if it's not pressed, then it would not be true, it would be false. If it is pressed, it would be true, and we'll do that. We'll just skip the instructions. Simple enough. That should be good, and we'll put that within the debug text here. Say skip next instruction if key in v percent x is pressed. And then I'll put keypad value. I don't think we have a boolean. I mean, we have b, but that's not a boolean. I guess I'll just do d, because technically booleans are going to be int 0 or 1, I think. True or false. So we'll just do that but I want to print out the value to see, you know, if we're getting the right thing there. So let's say that's instruction.x, and then we will check key in vx. Well, let's, let's print that as well. That should be guaranteed to be 0 to 15, but regardless, um, it's only one byte, so two hexadecimal digits. Chip a v offset by x, and we'll also have the keypad value, which would be the keypad offset by <laughs> that value. This has got to be close to what Java programmers feel on a fraction of their daily basis. Typing the chip eight and the arrow syntax for everything, but okay, we could make. A couple of like small, we can say alias variables maybe, or helper variables or something for that, so we don't have to type this out every time. I was thinking about that earlier a little bit. Like instead of doing, or if we wanted something more ergonomic like this, we could set a, a pointer, you know. 
UN8TV, and that can equal, because it, it, this will be outside the chip 8 struct, sort of, that object there. It'll equal the address of that. Could say it'll equal V, we'll just do that. And then we could offset by V, you know, a number zero to FF. <laughs> um, if this was a pointer, let me, yeah, I, I meant for this to be a pointer. That makes more sense, doesn't it? If we had a pointer to there, then we could set the value, and that should set the value within this, right? So that would be easier. I might think of doing that. Later, that would cut down a lot of typing and make logic like this appear a lot easier, but I don't know. I could I could have made these globals to begin with, but that would defeat the purpose of having it within a shared state struct kind of thing, but, you know, that's not too important right now. This should be getting the value. Hopefully, this will say if not pressed. So we know in the debug output, if we get a one, it's pressed, and a zero, it's not pressed. So then I can see, hey, is the next instruction two away or four away from the program counter uh, for this current instruction? We know if it's four away, then it did skip. And if the value was one and it was this instruction, then that's good. If not, then that's bad, <laughs> and vice versa for this. But I don't think these are tested because I didn't see E being tested in things. So. It's unfortunate, but we can move on to the Fs, the last sort of class or category of instruction, just to get those out of the way and, and test them and play some games and stuff. So we can start with FX0A. Let me see if this compiles right quick. It does not, because I'm bad at my job. Do you mean chip eight? I did, 686. Oh. Bat finger and things again. 686 control or shift G. There we go. Let's press an H. Yeah, that doesn't work, does it? <laughs> but control P, I don't fat finger. All right. So we'll just do that here. This one I am going to switch because there's a few number of these, but they only differ by the last two. So by NN and the instruction. So we can switch on that. Let's have default not do anything. So the first case is 0a vx equals get key. So 0a fx 0a vx equals get key. So what does this do? A key press is awaited, like await, async, and then stored in VX, blocking all instruction halted until next key event. So this will block current instructions from happening. I believe, I believe the display and the timers still update, which I think this guide, he talked about that as well. FX0A, get key. It loops forever until a key is pressed, it's blocking. Yeah, and we can decrement the PC, but I'll go over that. The timer should still be decreased while it is waiting. So I'm gonna update the display and decrease the timer still, which we'll do in a bit, but that'll be when the display is updated anyway, every 60 Hertz. Um, but I just wanna make sure that the, those things are still updated. And so we'll just wait until the key is pressed and then store it in VX, okay. So how would we go about doing that? You wait until a key press and store in VX. So we can check if any of the keys have been pressed, which we need to be setting from handle input. So I guess I could do that. Put a temporary to do there, because that would make more sense when we can actually store key presses if we're, just go here, if we can uh, actually store them to begin with. So, okay. We'll do handle input on the key down or key up events. So let me, I can put it here maybe. We'll say chip eight keypad. We'll have like a little table here. Let's say our QWERTY keyboard, or maybe you have a Zerti or something. Zwert, that's not a thing. <laughs> or some other thing, but I'm, I'm on QWERTY, so I'm gonna assume QWERTY. So chip eight had, I think it was one, two, three. Was it A? I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember, why would I remember? This doesn't have it there, does it? I wonder if the PDF has it. I think four is that, yeah. Does this have like keypad on here? Maybe, maybe not. 
I just want like a picture of it, which I think that guide has it, so I'll look at that in a second. If this does not say, I don't remember. You know, like RAM circuits, it has block diagrams for RAM circuits. You figure they'd have a picture of the keypad. Maybe it does and I'm just impatient, which is also true. So, <laughs> but I know this thing has, here, that's what I wanted. 123C, 456D, 789E, A0BF. Okay. That's what I wanted. 6D, uh, 789E, and A, 0, B, F. All right, so that's the original key keypad. Uh, typically, put this over here. Typically, emulator devs just use like the left side of a uh, QWERTY for these. So we can just map these ourselves, just the four rows here. So I'll just do it like that. Although it could make sense and be better for some games and things if the user uh, or the person running this program wanted to switch the keyboard layout, either for other machines that weren't the Cosmac VIP or other emulators might assume a different layout, or instead of, um, I think two Q, E, and S were used as arrow keys, directional keys originally, at least for a lot of games they assume that, so we can make that like map to WASD or something, or the arrow keys <laughs> on your keyboard for some more ergonomic option, but we'll just go with this for, because I don't want to think about doing that right now, <laughs> for simplicity's sake. Okay, space. Let's say we have other things here. SDLK, I don't remember. I think it's just SDLK, like, A. So I'll go, I have the API thing here. Let's go to keyboard. Oh, that's the actual code. I like that it links to that, though. That's nice. Let's say, oh, D is the D key. Okay. So A would just be the A key, S-D-O-K-A, and then just the numbers. Okay. So these are lowercase. wonder if they do uppercase. Well, it said it was uppercase. I don't think they matter. I guess if you do shift and you check the modifier, you would know. But I'm not going to check the modifier keys. Because I am lazy. So we'll do like A for the A key. But I have 1, 2, 3, 4 is going to be 1, 2, 3, C. So let's check 1. And break. So let's say we have the keypad, which we passed in. And that is not a constant, it's just a pointer. So keypad offset by 1. We'll set to true if the key is down. And we'll do break. And for the purpose of saving lines, I can just do like one-liners here. I don't normally like to do this, but we can get it all on like uh Get it easy, an easy thing like here, right? So let's copy that and do 15p. There we go. I believe there's a way to input like monotonically increasing numbers as a pattern in Vim as well. I don't remember how to do that. <laughs> I think there's an easy way to do that, but I'll just have to do like one, two, three. Uh, this one will be four. This is what we're pressing on QWERTY, and then we're mapping that to what we press on the chip eight keypad. So that would be one. 2, 3C. Then we have the next one, which is Q, W, E, R, F, A, S, D, F, and Z, X, C, C, and V. We could separate it out by rows if that's easier to read, but that's fine. For Four, five, six, and then D. Yeah, that's easier to read for me, actually. Let me do that. Separate it into fours for each row. Seven, eight, nine, E, and then A, zero, B, F. Okay. Did I make that mistake yet? Yeah, no, nope, no mistakes made. That's good. So we'll do the same thing. Same thing for key up, and I'll just put here, map, QWERTY keys, the chip eight, keypad. 
So we'll do the same thing under the key up event, except I will make them false instead of true. I don't need the final break there either. Of course, I could put a default under these though. Which I did, but just make that consistent there. Okay, but instead of true, we'll do false. So let's just go all the way down here and replace those. Okay. Multiple default labels in one switch. That's Oh, this was this was the default here. Yeah. Okay. There we go. That is a case. We could have a, I thought I was doing the other default though. Well, the other default wouldn't be part of this case. Those are returns, right? This is for the overall switch, right? Yeah. Like this, this default is for the overall switch. That was why I wanted to do that. But I think this thinks that it's not that one. <laughs> all right, that's all right. Whatever, that's that's fine. If it doesn't reach it, then it it won't. I have a break there. What is the? This is for. Oh, that's for the switch. That's for the key down switch. Here's for the key up. So I want to do that as well. Okay. So I'm glad it told me that issue. <laughs> I want to switch on the key symbol to get the symbol that we're switching on. So I do need to do that for both. Let's do that here. This is a default key. This ends the switch. All right. And then that will be a break for the case for key up. That's what I wanted to do. And then we can have, yeah, the overall default for the overall switch. Okay. Where it's not a key up or key down, that would be for this event dot type. Okay. That's what I wanted to do. That is that. Make sure these are still good. Okay. I say okay a lot. That's how I keep my mind going. All right. So it's probably like a tick or something. That would be the keyboard. So now we can go back to the to do, which is fx zero a vx equals get key. We need to a wait for that. So let's have a for loop here. We'll have i zero, i less than, I mean, we could do f or 16 or uh, probably just size of, that would be fine. Because the keypad is its own array. So size of keypad. So we want to wait until the key is pressed. How do we detect if a key is pressed? If one of those is true. If it's released, it'll be false. But if it's pressed, when we press something down, it'll be true. So we can check that here. If they press a key and then release it, Trying to think how key repeating would work if I'm gonna break key repeating. Because if they press and then release it immediately, it'll be set false. But I guess we can see in a certain game if it works or not. I the chip eight will probably be running fast enough to where that won't be too bad. Because the key would be pressed, it would run through the input events and then go through the game logic and then go back to handle input within a you know 16 milliseconds. So probably it probably won't be that big of an issue. So we'll just see. But okay, if one of the keys is pressed, then the keypad value would be true. So we can check if, if keypad i, then it would be true. And how do we store that key? Well, i will be the value zero to the size of the keypad. So zero to 15, effectively, we can just store that within, um, within the VX, the VX register. Because i will be the key value, it'd be the offset. So I equals key offset into keypad array. So VX equals what? It equals I. So that would be if a key is pressed. So if a key is not pressed, if a key is not pressed, then none of those will be true. Actually, I can break the for loop here. So we could either go and set none of them are true. I can just set a con, uh, well, not a constant. I can set a small thing here. We'll just say any key pressed is false and this will do any key pressed is true. 
And we can say if not any, this is an RPG, can't do that. If not any key pressed, uh, then we want to wait. Yeah, if, if no key has been pressed, then we want to wait until the key is pressed. So the way of waiting until the key is pressed and not running other instructions, but the timer and the display and everything will update every 60 hertz, but to not run any other instructions, or another way to say that is to only run the current instruction, this wait until the key is pressed, we can decrement the program counter. So we can do that. So that will be um, keep getting the current opcode and running this instruction. And that's what this will do. We'll do if no key has been pressed yet. There we go. Keep getting the current opcode and running this instruction. So we'll decrement that so that the next opcode we get all the way up here. The next opcode we get will be for the same instruction because we already pre-incremented. We can decrement and then it would get the same value here. So instead of skipping the next instruction, like for you know these conditional statements here, we're just waiting on the same instruction. So equivalent also to a jump to the current address. We could put in and run you know the, the opcode for jumping to the current address, but we're not doing that. So that should wait until the key is pressed. All right, so what else do we have? That's FX0A. So I also have one E, which is add VX to I. VF is not affected. We can see this via, I think we can see this code if we try to run like uh, like Tetris or something. So let me do that while I'm still thinking about it. So I probably put it a couple ones up, right? Is it ROMs, games, Tetris? Like I believe this runs and waits for a key. Maybe, maybe not. Well, that's to draw everything first and it's slow. Yeah, let me wait for that to happen. So are we waiting for keys here? We're doing unimplemented. We're checking some things. I thought this would wait for a key. It checks to see if keys are pressed or not. And does F6. So it skips if five, six, four, or seven is pressed. Okay. So we can actually see what games are checking for which keys if they have logic like this. So that's something, even if it's not fully implemented yet. So check if those. Well, we can press a key. So we can press um, five, which would be before four, five, six would be QWE. So we can see if we press QW or E if one of these is like not true. Maybe. Maybe not, it's trying to draw stuff. I think I paused it too much. Oh well, it's taken a while, so. <laughs> I guess we won't worry about that until we get a timing better. Let me get these instructions done before I do that and stop uh, getting off course here, I guess. So okay, one E is I plus equal VX, so add VX to I to value it. Data register VX, add to the index register. Do not change the carry flag. Except for one single Commodore Amiga, which sets it, which depends on, one game depends on that behavior. Oh, you had to be that guy, Space Fight. Space Fight, not Flight. Space Fight 2091, factorial. <laughs> or are they yelling? Is it Space Fight 2091? Or is it Space Fight, huge number, because that's a factorial? I don't know. Animal race depends on it not being affected. Ooh. Well, I'm not going to care about the Amiga this stream, so this video, <laughs> not stream. We can care about the Amiga some other time. It had a nice bouncing ball demo, and I think people still use uh, Amiga Research OS and other things too, so that's cool. But Okay, I plus equal VX. My brain's going off topic too much. FX1E, let's do that. Let's do that. FX1E, so I plus equal VX, add VX to I, uh, 
I'm doing, let's say for original, I'll just say for not, for non Amiga chip eight does not affect VF. I guess I'll put that down, whatever. <laughs> other ones I didn't put down discrepancies for other versions like super chip, but I guess I'll put that there. Cause it could affect chip eight just only for the Amiga. So, okay, we can do that. We can do chip eight I gets VX added to it. I don't think I put this within debug either. So I'll add all this to that. So that'd be V offset by X instruction dot X. And we'll just add that to the I value easy enough. Da -da -da. Let's just grab that whole thing there. Well, I could break after that, right? Cause that's the end of the case. There we go, put it there. So for debug info, uh, let's do a wait till a key is pressed. Store key and V percent X. So this one, I'm not gonna print much info out. <laughs> Just say only X, not gonna care too much about that. This one will say I plus equal VX. Yeah, that's fine. Let's do, um, I'm getting lazier with these as I go. That's, that's all right. Not great. I is use the offset into RAM so it can hold addresses. So let's say instead of 12 bit, we'll just give it the full 16 bit treatment there. So I have I, the value at I plus equal VX and we'll do the value in VX. We'll do that. So we'll have I, yeah, I'll just print that. We'll print X and the value in X, okay. Hey, I can do that, add V percent X to register I. I don't know. Does that, does that even matter? This kind of explains it, right? I plus equal VX. I think that explains it. I could give the ending value though. Result. Resulting I. Well, I'll just do result. And we'll say the result's going to be an I. And percent O for X. And we'll just add those here. Let's be I plus. V offset by instruction X. And we'll add those together, okay. Okay, so that's one E, that'll add those. Then we have timer, which is 07. VX equals get delay, set VX to the value of the delay timer, which will be corresponding to this. Set the delay timer to VX, which is 15. So these kind of go hand in hand. So that's easy enough. Yeah, that's easy enough. That's case zero seven, right? Yeah, zero seven. Fx07, is it Vx is, yeah. Vx equals delay timer. So set V, the VX value equal to the delay timer, which I have in the opcode here, yep. Delay timer, okay. And then one five, we'll set delay timer to VX. Just the opposite there. I'll just delete that, put it there. Wasn't as smooth as I wanted that, but I forgot. <laughs> when I paste things in, it goes before the cursor, not after the cursor, so, okay. Uh, but yeah, that's just the opposite, right? 15, set delay timer to VX, okay. Easy enough. 
And well, since I'm here, I'll just do the sound timer one because that's right underneath one eight. Set the sound timer to VX, which would be the same thing here. Except this is the sound timer. Nice, very easy. So I'll put those under our debug output up here. So zero, seven, one, five, one, eight. So what does that look like? Is there any relation? Did they lay these out specifically on purpose? Because these are related. Maybe the timer opcodes were in the lower bits or something for these lines. Yeah, three ones. I was like, what is seven again? <laughs> it's just three ones. Uh, eight, four, two, and one. Yeah, it's all Fs. So they just set that bit. No, I'm thinking F, not 15. God. <laughs> That's one and five. So four and one. Sure. More tired than I thought I was today, apparently. That's all right. Yeah. I don't think there's any relation between these. <laughs> I thought there would be. I guess there isn't. I guess not. I figured there would be because they were close by and close together in the instruction list, but probably not. So, Oh, well. Let's print out the debug output. Set V percent X equal delay timer. Delay timer value, which I'll put percent O two X because it's zero to two fifty five. I guess this I could the timer values I could print just as ints, but eh, I could read it as hex. It's fine. They may they may make a little more sense as integer values, and they will decrease at sixty hertz, but. Trying to think how this would work if I'm testing like timing or I'm trying to debug output for uh, print debug output for timing purposes. If it would read easier as an integer like 100 to 50, y'all know it's been 50 timer ticks instead of you know, whatever that is in hex. <laughs> yeah, but that's fine. It, it won't be too hard to read it. So I just, I'm just a wimp with that, I guess. We just need to read X and the delay timer. There we go. This one will set the delay timer equal VX. Set delay timer value equal V percent X. And I'll give the value for that because I know that's what it will be. So X and this. X and V offset X, yep. And the sound timer will be VX. Okay, but VX does not equal the sound timer. We don't get the delay timer into a data register. We just set the sound timer from FX18. There's only thing to, yeah, there's only an instruction to set, not get. So that's something to keep in mind. Although you can add your own if you wanted easily enough for that, but that's all right. I guess why would you want to know the ticks for sound? It'll only sound when you have it. Um, but it might be good for game devs to debug with an instruction for that. Set I to the location of the sprite for VX. Character 0 to F are represented by 4 by 5. Okay, so I will be the location of the sprite for the character, and the character will be 0 to F in VX. So this would change depending on where you put the characters or where you put the font for chip 8. And I just put mine in the start of memory, so we can just offset 0 to F for the VX value. We can offset the VX value multiplied by 5 bytes. Hold on, let me look at my font again. <laughs> this is what, FX29? Yeah. Let's put that down first. Let me see how my font is laid out. 0x29, 0x, FX29, set. Register I to sprite location. I'm going to put in memory uh, for character and VX zero to F, which are represented by four to four by five font, pretty much traditionally. 
All right, so the font that I have here, so each one is five bytes. That's one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, okay. Because it said four by five font, and I was like, what do you, yeah, it's because they only take up the first four bits, so they're only drawn four pixels wide, but there's five bytes, so five rows of four pixels. That's, it was confusing me. Okay, but each character is going to be five bytes. So all we have to do is offset by five times whatever the character is in VX, zero to F. Since I loaded that into the chip eight RAM starting at zero to be easy with it, we can just offset by the value in VX times five to get the current character. That's easy enough. Laid our font out pretty good. I'll move that up. Hopefully a little easier to see. So chip eight I will equal chip eight V offset by instruction dot X multiply by five. I think we just set it to that, right? Because when we draw something, we're drawing offset from I. If we were to draw a character on the screen, that's sprite data, we would draw offset from I, however big our character is going to be, which would usually be like five rows. So I would be, I would have the value that is going to offset into RAM. So I'm trying to think, I was like, do I need to set I to the RAM value? It's like, no, I think I can just set it to the actual int here, the actual number, and it will be offset from in a in some following instruction. I will be used. So I think that'll be okay. I think that'll be okay. Let's put that up here. So set I to Location, well, I can just write it back out. Sprite location and memory for a character in V percent X, which will be, should be zero to 15, zero to F. But we can see if we get that or not. So X and V offset by X. Um, we'll do times five for result. Try to think, do I want to, do I want to put the times five value? Does it matter? Does it even matter? It might matter <laughs> just for full debug info, just to be really granular with it. Result will be VX times five. We'll just say which should still be well within the range of zero to 255, I would think. So we can just put that twice here. Yeah, okay, so it'll be that. It's 15 times five is only gonna be 80 anyway, and there's only 80 bytes, so yeah. Okay, um, 80 is a lot less than 255, so that number should not overflow or anything, is what I, that's what I meant to say there. <laughs> okay, so then we have FX33, which is binary coded decimal, which just takes whatever the decimal value is in binary. So if the, if the binary value is nine, then the decimal value will be nine, which is it's binary coded decimal. Which, let's just look at this. I think I got that right, right? And binary clock might show these things. Each digit has a fixed number of bits, usually four or eight. Some can be used for a sign. So four bits can represent zero to nine, and the value in binary zero to nine, in this case, will be equal to zero to nine. It'll be the same between binary and decimal. So you're encoding the decimal number within the binary values. That's why it's called binary coded decimal, if that makes sense. I know a good bit about this because at my <laughs> day job, I programmed for 9BMI or AS400, as it's still known as, and they use EBCDIC internally, which is extended binary coded decimal interchange, I think. So you can look that up if you want. Just know that ASCII is a lot better <laughs> and we can use ASCII and UTF-8. So there's no reason that EBCDIC, in my opinion, should be existing anymore, but you can look that up on your own. It's kind of dumb because some ranges aren't contiguous, but at least the numbers and letters are. 
but I don't I don't like it as much as ASCII. But anyway, binary code decimal, that's fun. So FX33 stores the representation of VX and BCD with the hundreds digits at I, tens at I plus one, and ones at I plus two. So we can hack off the ending digit and store it at I plus two, and then again at I plus one, and then again at I, it looks like. So hundreds is at I. Yeah, tens and then I plus two. Okay, so if you read it out in memory from I to I plus one, I plus two later on, then you can print out like one, two, three here. So ones, tens, hundreds. Although it may be backwards, we'll see. I may get this backwards and we'll have to reprint it out depending how scores and things look. Uh, depending if your game has like a score like Pong or something. That's an easy way to tell if we got that wrong or not. It'll give a completely different number than it should be. And I'll put that down here with the FSR and emulate instruction. 33, 0x, fx, 33. Store. Store BCD representation of VX at memory offset from I. So let's do this. We'll say I equals, I equals the ones plate. I already forgot. <laughs> the hundreds digit is I. Okay. So hundreds place, um, I plus one equals tens place. I plus two equals ones place. Okay. So let's just set something here. We'll call it BCD, and that'll equal the value within VX. And then we can take BCD mod 10, which will be zero to nine, and that will be the ones place. So we can store that in memory, which is gonna be offset within the RAM of chip eight from offset I. And this will be the ones digits. We'll do I plus two. Okay, so the, the first digit that we're chopping off of the right, so BCD, uh, for example, was one, two, three, then we would be getting the three here and storing that with an I plus two. And we can divide equal by 10, and we can do that two more times. We could do this in a loop to probably save a couple lines as well, but oh well. We'll do I plus one, chop it off again, in this case, we got rid of that when we divided by 10, so we'd be left with 12. This 12 would correspond to the tens place, the tens digit. So we would store that with an I plus one, divide by 10 again. We'd be left with the one, that is the hundreds place digit. And I just have to do I, which would be uh, BCD at this point. So, okay, that's all we have to do. Hopefully, it's all we have to do. Of course, we could also do um, if we made this, if you had to deal with like a constant for some reason, then we could modulo 100 and then divide and do other stuff. But I think just making this mutable is better because we can just do this. That's easy enough to read, right? These won't be I's, of course. These will be chip 8 I. Almost forgot that. Compiler would have yelled at me. Which it is known to do. All right this up here in case we have to debug it. A lot of back and forth. It's probably why it takes me a long time. <laughs> That's all right. So we're BCD representation v percent x should be percent to x at memory from i. We'll just say what this equals and I will be percent oh four X. So this would be X and we'd have V offset by X and we would have I. Okay, well, let's see if that runs. That does that. I'm, I'm gonna fill out these. I'm just gonna fill all these out and then do the test op code because we only have two more. <laughs> I wanted to test in the meanwhile, but I'm like, yeah, I'll just do it at the end. So store, we want to register dump. So dump the registers, V0 to VX including, including. Okay, so V0 to VX inclusive. So if this was F355, it would store V0, one, two, and three. 
Store those in memory starting at address i, and then offset by one for each one. So the offset is increased for each value, but i is left unmodified. Unless you're in, okay, in super chip, i is unmodified. In original chip 8 and chip 48, i is left incremented. Okay, so some programs and games might expect it to be incremented then, because I'm writing for non S chip. Well, then again, I did S chip for this, didn't I? I'll just do S chip then, F it, whatever. <laughs> if a game needs something else, we can have it be uh, configurable. We can set that as a configure flag later. That, that'll be okay. I'm not in the mood to care too much right now. I just want to get it done. And that is okay. So register dump v0 to vx inclusive to memory offset from i. So let's do s chip does not increment i. Chip 8 does increment i. We'll just say that right now. I think that's reasonable. All right, and this is in the debug output, so let me, I can just print debug right here. V0 to V% percent X, inclusive. Uh, let's grab this, put it there. memory from i. That's x, data x, and i. Okay. I could write out all the register values here since I'm dumping the registers. Or I can just put what the instruction does. <laughs> what does 6.5 do? That loads the registers. Fills from v0 to vx inclusive from memory starting at address i. Okay. Oh, well, I'll put that as well just because I'm already here, and then we'll actually emulate them and not just print debug text. But I'm already here, so. I'll do register load v0 to vx from memory offset at i. From memory offset from i, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Let's put these all the way down here. The last two in chip eight instructions. So we're almost done here with the instructions, not with emulation and everything, but <laughs> uh, that's okay. V0 to VX inclusive. So it depends what the value in X is, but we can do UN8T, let's do I zero, I less than, cause that'll still go up to it, I believe. Well, we want to include it, don't we? Yeah, so i less than or equal, probably. If it's 3, we want 0, 1, 2, and 3. So yeah, i less than or equal instruction.x, i plus plus. So how do we register dump these to memory? Well, we're going to be writing to RAM, offset from i. And should put c's there for increment. But I'm going to do the S chip or super chip right here, I guess, until we make it configurable. So I'll put a, uh, I'll put node or something. S chip or chip eight logic for I. Let's do that. Okay. So I offset by the little I. Yeah, and we'll dump to that location. Okay, yeah, and that will equal chip 8v offset by i. Because i will start at 0 and go, go up to x, which would be vx inclusive, and we'll store that at memory offset starting from i by the byte corresponding to the register from 0 to x inclusive. Yeah. So that, I think, will handle it. That should be, should be okay. And we'll have similar logic to load the registers from memory. We'll just reverse this thing here. This will equal the 
yeah, this would instead equal the data at the chip 8 memory offset by i 0 to x. We would set that into the data register 0 to x. Yeah, and that would be loading from memory. Just reverse it. Okay, yeah, so that should work. I think that'll be all right. And that is there. Oh, that's the whole table done. Let's see if the opcodes agree. They probably don't. <laughs> the opcode uh, test ROMs, that is. They, they probably don't. With my luck, everything's probably terribly wrong, but that's okay. We get there one step at a time. I like how AX doesn't print, but everything else prints. <laughs> I don't like that AX doesn't print. Is there anything that's like wrong there? I didn't do, no, I didn't do that. Am I doing something wrong there? Like, am I really? It just sets I equal to N and N. Is that bad? I don't get why it like, it says okay and then disappears. I don't like that. Maybe when we make it faster, it'll be okay. Maybe it's some like weird lag or delay with instruction and drawing that it gets set and then disappears too fast or something. I don't know. That's me trying to cope for being a terrible programmer. <laughs> An emulation developer. Emulator developer. E5. Well, E5 is better than RF or whatever it was before, wasn't it? E5. Okay, that's an error. Uh, that's my old thing. Let's go to... Which one is it? Is it Testrom? It's one of these. <laughs> This one, this says the error codes, 8xy5 verify vf is set to zero when there is a borrow. Eight xy5, am I doing this wrong? Vf to one if no borrow. Oh, so I need to set it to zero? I figure we would set it to whatever it was before. Well, I guess it would be zero, right? We're not setting it to one, but what if it's already one? Is that what they're saying? That's probably what they're saying. Okay, so I'm not setting it unless it's not, probably. Yeah, I'm just, I'm setting it to one, but if this is, if this is false, it won't set it to one and it might've still been one before. So I guess I have to just set it to the result. I can do that. I figured that wasn't the right way to go, but we can test that here. I mean, if that's what the test ROM says is the expected result, then that does make sense. We can set it to that value. Unless they gave it, they gave it F <laughs> as the VX register, which would suck, but maybe they don't, I don't know. Um, I can test that. No, that gives eight. That gives a different one. Eight is probably for the other one. Set the one when there's no borrow. Eight x seven. Yeah, eight x y seven. So did they do that one here? Yeah. Set v five equals v six. V f one if no borrow results. V f is zero. Yeah. Well, I guess I'm supposed to set it then. Okay. And I wasn't doing that. That's all right. Uh, let's just grab this. All right, set it equal to that and then do that. Probably want to set for 8xy4 as well. Does that come up for this? Uh, checks 8xy3. They're not checking 8xy4. So that's probably what I should do. Or not. Maybe only for the borrow ones. Maybe it's only for the borrow ones. I don't know. I don't know. Hey, okay. Just a couple of errors there. According to this test ROM, but that's alright. Bone which if you don't know, Francais means good. 
That's good. The best coder ever says we're good. Fabrice Bellard himself, no, but whoever wrote that said we're we're good. Okay. And I'll just check once again. The, I guess somewhat faulty test op code. See, AX says okay, but disappears. But I'm going to say that's a-okay, <laughs> I guess. I'll mess with the speed now. Um, we can test if a game plays, although it'll probably run way too slow. So probably not. I like testing with Tetris just because I know Tetris and it. I know it displays like a score and stuff, I believe, when you clear a row is why I'm thinking of using that just for testing these right now. So I keep coming back to it at least. It'll draw slow. Taking a key may be slow. I think it was QW and E for 456. I can hold it down. Or does that rotate? I look like that rotated. I think that rotates, but it's very slow. Okay, let's increase the speed. Of course, debug output's gonna be messy, so I can do make without debug, but let's increase the speed of this thing. Um, how fast do we want to go? We need to get the time as well. Let's make the speed configurable. So the CPU, our VM, our chip eight machine here. I don't have it there. I'll put it in the I'll put it within the config here. If we assume we're emulating some specific or some abstract in this case, fantasy virtual machine processor for this chip eight machine, how fast do we want that processor to run? What is the clock rate that we want that to run? In our case, it's not exactly like, you know, the Cosmic VIP or the Telmec 1800 where the RCA 1802 would have specific timing per instruction for however many milliseconds or nanoseconds or whatever that the add opcode for that processor would take to run compared to multiply or subtract or moving something to memory or not, right? Th those all have differing values of time that that take that they would take up. I'm just doing some abstract chip 8 machine, and we're going to assume that each instruction takes one clock cycle. So in effect, if we set our clock rate to some number like 500 hertz, we'll say 500 instructions a second, it would run 500 instructions in a second because I'm assuming one hertz, one clock rate is going to be one instruction. Um, that's what I'm going to do here. So I'm going to set another thing in our config sort of object here, and I'm going to call it instructions per second, or I could call it clock rate. I'll call instructions per second. We're assuming 60 hertz for other updates, so I'll just divide by 60 for that. That'll be really clean. We'll do um, not equal. <laughs> not equal. We'll just do instructions per second. We'll do chip 8, CPU, I'll say clock rate or hertz. Uh, yeah, we'll just do that. Line those up. Okay. And. Wherever I set that, which I think is in set config, that's where I set the defaults. So we'll do instructions per second, and let's set a rate of 500 maybe. I believe the guide that I'm using this guy is my single source of truth. <laughs> I think he said 700 or something was like a good amount timing. The original processors ran at something like one megahertz. HP 48 calculators for super chip ran at four megahertz. But yeah, they took a different number of cycles to run because they're processor specific. In practice, the standard speed around 700 fits well enough for most programs from the 90s. Okay. 500 may be a little bit slow, but we'll see how it runs. If it's too slow, we can increase it. Number of instructions to emulate one second. Clock rate of CPU. So we have a config with an instructions per second value. So when I'm emulating instructions here, I'm just going to make another loop. We'll say i is less than config instructions per second. And that would be in one second, but I'm going to update every 16 milliseconds or 60 hertz. So 60 times within a second, we want to update this. So if this is the number of instructions in one full second, to get the number of instructions in one sixtieth of a second for 60 hertz, we'll just divide by 60. So one of our emulator frames will run for approximately a sixtieth of a second. 
or run that many instructions in that frame. For this frame, let's say this, for this emulator frame, um, 60 hertz. And we wanna do some get time values. So let's look at SDL things for more precise timing. It should be in timers, yeah, timer.h. Let's go to get performance counter or ticks, either one. I'll, I'll do performance counter probably, which we'll use it before and after for profiling and we'll call get performance frequency, which these are both UN64 they return. Okay, so performance frequency we'll use for, all the way down here in their code example, you can take uh, counter values before and after a loop and take that, cast it to a double by a thousand for milliseconds and divide it by frequency and that'll give approximate milliseconds there as a float. And then we can delay for that value then. So delay one second is this much in ticks, this much for the performance counter. Okay. Which is all the way over here. So I can do that twice, start and now, which they have defined as UN64s. I guess SDL has its own UN types. Is that what these are? So I don't have to use even <laughs> the standard int types. I can use SDL. That's fine. That's fine. But I'll do that. I'll have a start and now basically get the difference and then delay for that difference. Um, or 16 ms minus that difference if it's less. If it's greater than, we'll just go on. But it might be a little slower in practice. We'll see. But okay. Um, I could do that within the loop here. Keep it local. Even. That's probably all right. Yeah, because the state will stay within the while loop. All right. Let's do... I can call it like before and after frame. I don't know. Naming's always one of the hardest parts. Let's have before frame equal... Get performance, is it counter or count? Get performance counter. And this, it doesn't say if it's the number of ticks, it just says the count per second of the high resolution, the high resolution counter. It doesn't say anything about that, but okay. Oh wait, no, get the current value. And frequency says get the count per second. Okay, so you get the current value of the counter and then you convert that into a count per second to test, you know, millisecond time elapsed. All right, that's what it was. The, pay the descriptions look similar, so I was kind of confused there. But let's get a before and after time sample here. So however long it took to ran these instructions. So for instance, it might take a little bit longer on the order of milliseconds or what have you, a little bit longer to say run the draw instruction where we're making we're sort of instantiating and drawing a bunch of rectangles right to draw the pixels on the screen that might take a little longer than just adding two numbers right so that could take longer on a per instruction basis some instructions could take shorter amount of time than others in other words and these time differences would be fluctuating right as well as whatever my host machine is running <laughs> with this being in a vm and you know so get time before running instructions and get the time, get time elapsed after running instructions. All right, delay for approximately 16.7 milliseconds. So we'll have 16 minus the actual time elapsed, which would be get performance frequency. So let's do that here. So let's do you want 64t. We'll do time elapsed. Although that was casted to a double. So you double the value divided by frequency and that returns probably a 64. Well that'll return a double is what they'll do. Okay so this is all parenthesized. Okay okay. We'll go off what that's doing. Do double. Yeah, double time elapsed is, I can just copy their code right now. <laughs> double do before frame, I guess this is time. Let's do before frame and after time, just to make a little bit better naming. Although it's longer, 
but before frame minus after frame, but after would be the time elapsed. So we want to do actually now minus start, right? Yeah, because that would be monotonic, that would be after. Or I could call it start and end. Start and end might make more sense, yeah. Naming is always the hardest part. That makes a little bit more sense. Because end minus start sounds better than after minus before. I think. And divided by a thousand. Is that, did they double? Yeah. Oh, they did now minus start parenthesis, and then this had a parenthesis. Oh, this is all within log. Okay. But dividing it because we casted this by double, that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Get performance, frequency. And that equals the time elapsed. We're not going to change that. Just make it a constant. And in case you can't see it, let's put it up there. So I want to delay for the maximum of that time. So let's say... I mean, it would be casted anyway, but we'll say 16.7 cast to a float or actual time elapsed. So if this is greater than time elapsed, then we'll delay for the difference. Otherwise, we'll just delay for zero. We won't delay for anything, we'll go on immediately. We've already wasted at least <laughs> 16 to 17 milliseconds waiting, so we'll just go on. Otherwise, we want to delay for the difference within the actual time elapsed and approximately 60 FPS here. An SDL delay only takes an int, so this will be sort of coerced or casted or whatever into an int. So it might be 16, for example, but we'll at least get hopefully a little bit closer and a more common average time here. More consistent, not common. Okay, that's how we'll go with delaying this. And these aren't going to change either, actually. We'll do const. Didn't mess that up. That's good. Okay. So if we run that on, I know I'm not doing the debug output, but if we run that on, say, the test op codes, they should finish a lot faster. Instead of doing one instruction a second, <laughs> it runs at 500 divided by 60 instructions per second, which is a little under 50. So, maybe 40 something. I have calculator up. I can put it up. Nope, 500 divided by <laughs> eight. No, oh, eight instructions per, per frame, whatever, not per second, per frame. It was one instruction per frame, now it's 8.3. So that runs 8.3 times faster, hopefully. But okay, and it looked like that was an issue with AFX and not running enough instructions before it updated the display, apparently. So that's good there. Okay. So the BC test as well should run faster. Yep. Finishes pretty fast. All right. And I can see how fast Tetris displays. Pretty fast. Oh, and we can actually move. So I'm pressing E right now. This is W. This is E. It's not moving down, so I feel like it's not actually correct. Maybe I don't have a delay timer correctly set. Um, Q is rotate. What is the A? A is drop. But it's supposed to... <laughs> it's supposed to move down, so I feel like I have a delay timer that's not being set correctly. Oh, that is true. Yeah, that's the one thing I forgot. Oh, sorry to tease you with that Tetris game and not clearing a row. That's one of the one things that I forgot. I'm updating the screen, but I'm not updating the timer. So yeah, there is no delay timer at zero. <laughs> as well as there not being a sound as well. So let's update. Yeah, update window with changes, and we'll update the timers. Which we'll pass in chip 8 there as well. We'll change the state of the timers. So we'll pass that in as a pointer. This will be a different function that we haven't made yet. Update delay and sound timers. So every 60 hertz, every 60 hertz. Okay, so let's make a delay timer thing here. 
We're already here. I'll just put it there. Update chip eight, delay and sound timers, 60 hertz. So this will be chip eight T pointer to chip eight. And we'll have, they update if they're above zero only. Right, both of them. Yeah, because they're not going to be negative. They would wrap around because I made them unsigned in, which would be bad. They both count down until they reach zero. So if they're above zero, they count down. So then we'll have, get get this out of the way. Let me alt tab. <laughs> if they're above zero, they'll count down. Right now, we won't play a sound, but we will put that in soon or maybe on the next video. because It's getting late for me. I'm getting tired uh, of talking, which I do too much. So with the late timer, we could just do that, really. But I'll make it a little more explicit if it's above zero. Then we'll decrement that sucker. And if the sound timer, probably have an if else for sound. If the sound timer is above zero, we do want to decrement. But we also want to play a sound, which I don't have sound set up right now. Um, so let me put a to do for that. To do, play sound. And we'll have else, it is zero. If it reaches this point, we'll stop, or otherwise, yeah, we'll just, we'll stop playing the sound. Stop. Because it could have just been above zero before this next tick, so it could be playing at the moment, depending on when we reach this function. So stop playing sound. Um, yeah. So that'll be at least one line, so these will be in blocks. I might turn off the not auto put comments. That's starting to get annoying for me, but okay. I think that'll be all right. Leave space for that next time. Okay. That'll involve a chip eight like audio device and getting audio spec. What we have and what we want, I'll probably do just mono eight or 16 bit PCM or whatever, some equivalent to that sound. We'll have to fill out a data buffer for a callback function that SDL will provide and we'll fill in sound data or get sound data from a file or something. I'll probably just fill it in in line. Um, we'll make a basic square wave data, which will just be like positive or negative value if we make signed bytes. Um, but uh, I'll get to that. That'll probably be on the next one. I just want to see if this delay works right here. So we'll delay and update that timer and the sound timer and the screen every approximately 60 hertz. Okay. Let's see. So this should be accurate and it should decrease down the screen now. Yep, there we go. <laughs> so the delay does actually work. That's good. It's a little slow, but then again, that guy said 700, not 500. And I have to keep the window focused if I want this to work. Let's try to get one row here just to see if the display works, because I believe this puts a number up here when I score, depending how long it takes. Uh, to actually clear a row here. And it's a little slow. We'll just wait till we get a line piece. Like, you know, that's what Tetris people do, right? I played a lot of Tetris when I was a kid. I had a game on like a flip phone. Back when people had flip phones. Or it might have been like an LG Chocolate, maybe. It was like a Chocolate or Envy, I think, was the one that I had. I wasn't cool enough for a Razor, or I was too old for a Razor. I don't remember. This was a long time ago. Let's see. We'll get at least one row. Hey! So we did get the right i, i plus one, i plus two values. So that was also what I wanted to test. Otherwise it would say 200 and not 002. So we got those correct. So I think we got most or all the instructions absent, maybe the random one, pseudo random. It should be okay and not have the same seed because we're seeding it with time null, right? But I think we have most or all the instructions done for regular chip eight absent some weird discrepancies between chip eight and super chip, which might only manifest in certain games or programs. So if there's other more granular um, test ROMs that you know of, let me know. Um, I'd be happy to look them up and, and test those. Otherwise, I think we're pretty much good to go. Yes, we still have sound to do. I'm going to do that on the next one because I'm tired and I wanted to make sure this worked. <laughs> so I'm going to get sound support working on the next video, but hopefully you enjoyed this. We can actually, you know, get games playing now. I think there was another T game, which was like tank, right? 
Uh, yeah, tank is one. Just for some things, we can use the arrow keys. The chip eight arrow keys, which are interesting. And it uses flight controls. Down is up and up is down. That's interesting. Okay. And then we can shoot. Oh. Uh, shoot. So this flickers. You can see the, the display flickers here, right? So if this is too annoying for you, and it or it's bad, and I'm assuming it would flicker more at higher CPU clock rates that we emulate. Um, if that's really bad and annoying, I can look at changing that as well, either in the next video or if it takes too long, the one after. But the next video, I'm going to try to do sound support. And I think one game for that would be Blitz. I'll, I believe it's called Blitz, yeah. Which I think is like um, Arkanoid or Breakout. Or that might be Brick, not Blitz. Blitz is probably different, actually. Blitz is this. So never mind, that, that wasn't the one I was thinking of. <laughs> Blitz is like bombing a city, is what that looked like. I think it's called Brick. Brick or Bricks? One of these is like Arkanoid. Yeah, this one. So in this one, every time a ball hits one of these, or it hits your paddle, it makes a little beeping sound. Although, depending how fast the game goes and what and the correct emulation speed and stuff is, it doesn't actually make a sound every single time because of STL audio buffers and things and how you set that up. So, But ideally, it would be making a sound every time you hit one of these or it hit the paddle. So that's a really good way to test out sound is with this sort of ROM here. As well as you see the flickering. If the flickering's annoying, I can try to... I think maybe do like a fade out instead of just fully on and off according to clearing the display or not, because it redraws everything, right? Potentially every 60 times a, a second. That's bad for flickering. Instead of fully on or off, we could try to fade fully on to fully off over a period of time, like a linear interpolation or something from full on to full off for the pixel, the foreground background colors. We could linearly interpolate. Uh, over each frame, reduced by a certain amount, and that may give a better visual effect than just on and off flickering. So I might look at doing that the next episode. Other than that, or at least first off, I would want to do sound. So I'll aim on sound support next time. If that doesn't take too long, I'll do that that fade out instead of flickering. See if we can have a, a compare and contrast there. I think that'll be it. Um, other than if people want to see super chip support, I can work on that afterwards as well. If you don't, then that'll be it. <laughs> Probably the only other thing would be implementing some command line arguments, because I haven't really done that yet. And that would just be passing, like, you know, if we wanted a scale value, we could do dash s or dash dash scale, scale factor, scale value or something. And that's just, you know, string comparing argv right? <laughs> Compared to what you sent, and then get the one right after for the value. So, you know, this would scale by two, for example, or this would scale by 200 and take up the whole screen or something. So, you know, we could set, in other words, we could make and set the values within our config T according to values that we pass into the program from the command line. So that, that would be, I think, pretty simple and easy to set up. So I can look at doing that, fading out or lerping the pixel color values instead of flickering, and sound. So I can aim for those on the next one. But yeah, thank you for watching. <laughs> Again, I do appreciate it. Thanks, and I'll see you then. Hopefully you found this somewhat entertaining or enjoying, or you know, you like the Chip 8 stuff and want to see other emulation-related things in the future, but I still got at least one more video to go. So yeah, I'll see you then. Thanks. Yeah. Cheers.